and 64. Well, good evening. Welcome to Victory Baptist Church tonight. Let's all get a songbook, stand and turn to page 164. Page 164. It's good to be back in the Lord's house. Good to see you tonight. And uh, let's get the ushers to come receive our offering this evening. And as we do, let's continue to remember those that are sick in our church, uh, that God will touch them and help them and lift them up. Amen. And uh, pray for all the needs. Pray for uh, Sister Janice. She'll be going tomorrow and having some tests done. So let's pray that everything will be well there. Uh, remember my wife. She's supposed to hear hopefully tomorrow from her x-ray she had Friday. And hopefully the uh, insurance company will uh, okay to get the MRI done. So just keep praying for her, Lord, and meet the need there. And uh, many others in our church that just needs a touch from heaven. Amen. And uh, let's remember those that are lost in our families, that God will deal with them. And then let's pray for our meeting coming up three weeks from tomorrow. Pray for revival. Amen. And that the Lord will give us a great uh, meeting. Pray for Brother Scott and them. That uh, God will use them in a great way. Amen. All right, well, let's pray and ask the Lord to have his way here this evening. Brother Gary, pray and ask God to bless the needs and offering tonight. Let's get a book, stand and turn to page 88, page 88.
all turn around and tell us here. Sure good to be here tonight, good to see y'all tonight, amen. Turned out to be a beautiful afternoon, the Lord gave us, and uh, the pollen is really thick, and everybody's <laughs> sneezing and coughing, and amen, but uh, that's the joy of living in North Carolina, I guess, but uh, all right. Get Brother Chris to come. He's going to sing a couple of songs for us tonight, so you pray for him as he comes to sing. Amen. Great. for me. <laughs> <laughs> I need another glass of this one. I need both of them. <laughs> My wife doesn't like me, uh, two pair of glasses at the same time. <laughs> hmm. Well, this is uh, one of the old hymns that uh, you don't hear a whole lot anymore, but uh, I was driving down the road the other week and uh, had the radio on Bluegrass Junction, which we tend to do every once in a while. And uh, this song happened to be coming up, coming over the radio. And I was like, wow, that's, uh, that's pretty good. And uh, it's one of the great old F uh, Fanny Crosby hymns, Tell Me the Story of Jesus. I figure if it's good enough for Bluegrass Junction, it's good enough for here. <laughs> Tell me the story of Jesus Right on my heart every word Tell me the story most precious Sweetest that ever was heard Tell how the angels in court sang as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God in the highest, peace and good tidings to earth. Tell me the story of Jesus, right on my heart every word. story most precious sweet as that ever was heard
tell of the cross where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him, tell how he liveth again.
you have your Bible tonight, turn with us to the book of Acts chapter number 9 tonight. Acts chapter number 9. <clears throat> first song, I believe that first song, Brother Chris sang, tell me the story of Jesus. Dr. Olive B. Green had that on his program every that's what it came on every day, I believe, Bill. Tell me the story of Jesus, isn't that right? And uh, I will never forget it. I guess he's still preaching, ain't he? He's been dead for 50 years almost. Still preaches every day on the radio. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and uh, I know he, he died just a few years before I got saved. And uh, I believe he died in 1975, if I ain't mistaken. Somewhere around there, I believe it was 75. I got saved in 79. The Lord called me to preach, and then we got ready to go to the mission field. I wrote uh, his wife a, a letter and told her that I was getting ready to go to the mission field, and uh, I would love to get a set of his books to carry with me. And uh, next thing you know, I got a big box at the house of all of his books, she sent them to me for free, and uh, that was a blessing, and I still got, the, got all of his books in my study, and I used to listen to Olive B. Green all the time, especially when we first got saved, we, we lived off of it, I mean, him, B.R. Lakin, all them guys on the radio, and it was a blessing, amen, and uh, I, I wished I'd had the opportunity to hear him in person, I got to hear Dr. Lakin in person. Uh, but uh, Dr. Green's still preaching every day. Amen. Every day. And uh, what a blessing it is. Here in the book of Acts tonight, I want to begin reading in Acts chapter number 9 and verse number 1. The Bible says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, that if he, uh, the message to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there, came, there shined about, round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there, or was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a man or a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For, behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house. And putting his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, 
the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for the privilege again to be in your house. On the Lord's Day, thank you, Father, for all that you have done. Thank you, Lord, for everyone in the building tonight, for everyone that has been here today. Thank you, Father, for those that have listened and have watched. And, Lord, I pray that, God, you would help us again tonight, Lord, as we open your word, that, God, as we study this portion of your word, that it may help us in our lives. God, it may uh, stir our hearts, dear Lord, in seeing, Father, what you can do in a person's life. God, I'm so thankful for the power of God that is able to save to the uttermost all that come to God through Christ. And Father, I pray tonight that you'd help us, strengthen us, stir us. Lord, we need revival. We pray for a move of God here in our church, in our homes, Lord, in our town, our county. God, we need you. And we're praying, Father, and asking you, Lord, to please, God, meet with us and help us here tonight. And Lord, everything that's done, we'll give you praise and glory and honor, for we ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. I want to preach tonight about the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Now, I believe as we move into chapter number 9, we can see that, and I believe that this is probably the most celebrated conversion experience in Christian history by this man, by the name of Saul. And uh, it also signals the beginning of the ministry of uh, probably the, the most prolific and wide-ranging evangelist in, in biblical record. And so as we look tonight at Saul, and we can see what God has done in his heart and his life. One thing I believe that it ought to do as we study this is that it should help us to believe that there's anybody, God can save anybody, amen? I don't care who they are, no matter how mean they are, no matter how wicked they are, God still is able to save, amen, those that will come to him uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, of course, first of all, we see Saul uh, the persecutor. Of course, we've read the verses here tonight, and it tells about Saul, how that uh, in verse number one, he yet was breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. He goes to the high priest and uh, desired of him letters to Damascus that he may go and uh, begin to try even more to wipe out and eradicate the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it was a seemingly a personal vendetta uh, for Saul uh, having scattered the church at Jerusalem, the Bible tells us uh, that Saul consented in chapter 8, verse number 1, that Saul was consenting unto the death of Stephen. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church that was at Jerusalem. And the Bible said that they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea, Samaria, except for the apostles. And now Saul has gone now seeking permission that he might branch out from Jerusalem uh, and to further engage those that have scattered themselves abroad uh, that he might bring them uh, seemingly to what they call justice. And, and of course Damascus, they say, is about 150 miles away, about a six-day journey from Jerusalem. And verse number two says that he wanted to go and desire that if he found any of this way. And so in other words, that was the, the, what they were calling Christians at the beginning as they began to say, anybody that's in this way or the way. I mean, they were doing everything they could to stop the spread of Christianity. But as we saw last time, it didn't stop the spread of it. The persecution only furthered the spread of the gospel. Amen. And so they were talking about those of this way. And it speaks much about it. Acts chapter 19 and verse number 9 says, When divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, 
He departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrrhenius. Acts chapter 19, verse 23. And the same time there arose no, no small stir about uh, that way. And so they were talking about Christianity. Acts 22, verse 4. And I persecuted uh, this way unto death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. And that's Paul as he's giving his testimony about how he persecuted those in this way. Amen. And he even persecuted them unto death. Acts 24 verse 22. And when Felix heard these things, having a more perfect knowledge of that way, he deferred him and said, when Lysus the chief captain shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. And so we can see that Paul was talking about that way, in this way, as he's talking about those who were believers in Christ. And then we can see the, uh, the persecution of Saul, the zeal uh, that he had in persecuting the church. And Paul's zeal is measured by the, the statements such as the threatenings uh, and the slaughter. I mean, he was not taking it easy on the church. He was doing everything he could, no matter how brutal it may seem, uh, against those who had trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, he said, and I persecuted uh, this way unto death. Uh, he said, whether they're men or women, it didn't matter to him he could have cared less who they were and what their standard was and their status was. If they were believers in Christ, he was doing everything he could, even putting some to death because of their faith. Amen. Acts chapter 22, verse 5, he said, I received letters unto the brethren and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem to be punished. When he left Jerusalem with those letters in hand, it was his intention to go to Damascus, round up a bunch of believers, bring them back to Jerusalem, have them uh, prosecuted, and then have them punished for their faith. And this is the kind of man that we're talking about tonight. That's the reason I say that if God could save this man, he'd have no, no problem saving anybody else. I mean, the very man that consented unto the death of Stephen, the very man that fought against uh, Christianity with everything he had in his power. But God had other plans for him, amen? Well, I'm thankful God can see what we cannot see. In Galatians chapter number 1 and verse 13, uh, Paul said, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure, Paul's talking about himself, he said, how that beyond measure, I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. I mean, it sounds, I mean, he was, he was wicked, amen? Wicked, mean, vile. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 13, he said of himself, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Amen. And so Paul, even of his own testimony, as he's writing to other churches after he's saved, he's telling them the kind of person that he was before he met the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, there's some of us in here tonight, we could tell some tales of how wicked things that we have done and all the things we have I've been involved in. But, oh, listen, I'm thankful that all that's behind us now. Amen? I mean, and in spite of the way that we were, I'm glad that God had mercy on us. We were like Paul. We obtained mercy, amen, because of the grace of God. And God saved us just like he saved the apostle Paul. So we can see Saul tonight. First of all, we see him as the persecutor. We can see how, how vile that he was, how mean that he was. I believe it was the, probably the meanest man around. But he was a religious man. That's the sad part of it. He was very religious, but he was mean. 
May I say tonight, religion makes people mean. Amen. Salvation changes your life. Religion uh, manages your life and makes you uh, mean toward other people. Amen. So Saul, the persecutor. But then we see something happening. We see Saul on the road to Damascus. Now just think about it. Here's Saul. He's already consented to the death of Stephen. No telling how many other men and women he has had jailed, had beaten, and had seen all kinds of things that had gone on. And now he's got permission to go to Damascus. He's got letters and he's got the authority to find any in this way to bring them back and have them punished. So he's on his way. I'm sure he's thinking, man, I can't wait till we get there. We're going to round up that bunch and we're going to bring them back and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. Amen. And I'm glad God had other plans. And while he was on the road to Damascus, he met the Lord. Amen. Look at it again, if you will. Look at verse 3. Now, he's, he's got the letters, and he's on his way in verse number 2. Whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Verse 3, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. <laughs> and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul. Why persecutest thou me? Now that would have been enough for me right there. I'm riding along and all of a sudden a light from heaven is so bright that knocks me to the ground. And then I hear a voice saying, Saul, Saul. That would have been enough. And I believe Saul, according to the scriptures here, he knew who that voice was. Look at verse number of course, verse 4, he said, Why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? By a light from heaven, like he had never seen before, and a voice from heaven that he had never heard before. No doubt he understood it had to be the Lord in heaven. Amen. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Look at verse 6. Here's this man that has consented to death. He's put people in prison. He's had them beaten. He's got authority in his hand, Brother Mark. He's going down there to arrest people. Now he's trembling. <laughs> I mean, this wicked man is now trembling before the Lord. In verse 6, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Now here we find Saul on the road to Damascus. And Saul's encounter with the Lord was a dramatic experience. Now I dare say that any of us in this building tonight saw a bright light from heaven heard an audible voice from heaven when you got saved. Amen. But this is the, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. And God had already, he, he told Ananias, he's a chosen vessel unto me. In spite of all that Saul was doing, God knew who Saul was, even though Saul didn't know who God was. And God had already picked out that he was going to use this man by the name of Saul. Now, the circumstances and, and uh, the emotions uh, uh, when, when somebody gets saved uh, is different for every person. Your experience, my experience of what happened when we got saved is all may be different, but we all got saved the same way if you got saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We got saved by trusting Jesus to be our Savior. Now, Paul, as we look at his life, see how God saved him. Now, you and I tonight do not have a Damascus Road experience like 
Saul had were bright lights and a voice from heaven. But each of us do know when we got saved. Each of us did have an experience with the Lord when we gave our heart to Christ. Amen. Now, salvation is based upon the facts of the Word of God and not feelings that arise from circumstances. We're not saved because we felt like we got saved. We're saved because we believe the Word of God and we based it on the truth of God's Word not on our feelings. And uh, I'll be honest with you, it's been a long time. I don't really remember a lot of feeling when I got saved. I'd never been in a, a church that experienced a lot of feelings when I was growing up. Our church wasn't that, uh, uh, we was in a, a Southern Baptist church and it wasn't, you know, it was, uh, wasn't a, people wasn't running the aisles and jump, jumping off the back of the pews and hanging from the lights, amen. And, and so I didn't never know that much about emotion and, in church, and so there wasn't that much emotion, and all I knew was I believe what that book said. I believe the facts as they were stated to me from the Bible. I was a sinner. He's the only Savior, and if I would turn from my sins and put my faith in Him, He would save me, and that's exactly what happened. And so it's not based on our feelings. Amen. It's based on facts. Now, Think about it. Think about some of the other people that got saved in the Bible. Their experiences were different, but yet they got saved. Think about the woman at the well. The woman at the well, it was a realization of who Jesus Christ is to her. The Bible tells us in John chapter 4, verse number 28, 29, of course, we've, in chapter number 4, Jesus is sitting on the well, and this woman of Samaria comes to draw water. And he asked her to give him water. And she said, who are you, a Jew, asking me, a Samaritan, to give you water? But Jesus said, if you knew who it was that asked thee of water, you would have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. <laughs> Amen. And after their conversation and uh, and she began to reveal who she was. Hey, the Lord already knew who she was. He said, I know you've already been married five times, and my husband, you got the man you got now ain't yours. He already knew everything about her. I believe she was, if she hadn't got saved, she probably got married five more times. She was, I ain't gonna say it anyhow. Wipe that out right quick. But the woman, when she met the Lord, when she saw and, and she knew that he was the Messiah, all the Bible said after that she realized who he was and what she had done, the Bible said the woman then left her water pot, went into the city and saith unto the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? I mean, her experience was totally different than any of us in this building tonight. Did any of y'all get saved at a well? But she did. Amen. I mean, praise God, but she met the Lord that day. Amen. Think about it. Think about the Ethiopian eunuch. It was an understanding of the Scriptures and a clear confession of faith in Christ. Acts chapter number 8, in verse number 35, they said, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. This Ethiopian eunuch was going down the road in his chariot, and Philip joined himself with it. And Philip said, Do you understand what you're reading? He said, How can I except some man show me? He was reading from Isaiah 53. And he took that same scriptures and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, This is it. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Amen. And they came out of that chariot and went down there and he baptized him. I mean, listen, his conversion was totally different than the woman at the well, but yet he met the Lord, amen? 
Think about Lydia, the seller of purple. Lydia, her heart was simply open to the things that she heard preached. Acts chapter 16 and verse number 14, the Bible said, and a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto things which were spoken of Paul. Each one of them was different. Think about the Philippian jailer. Man, he had a, a, a tremendous experience, didn't he? I mean, he's the, he's the jailer keeping watch over all the prisoners, and all of a sudden, he had two prisoners in there that wasn't going to turn over and go to sleep and sleep it off the rest of the night. At midnight, they started praying, singing, praising God. God moved in and set them all free. The jailer saw what had happened, thought it all escaped, was going to kill himself. But Paul said, do thyself no harm. We're all here. The jailer called for a light, sprang in, fell down and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Amen. Oh, listen, there was all these experiences, but yet the one main key ingredient was they all believed in Jesus. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let me just give you things that are true, I believe, with Every salvation experience. First of all, there's light. The light of the gospel has got to shine into the hearts. Amen. Matthew 4, 16, the Bible said, The people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region in the shadow of death, light is sprung up. Acts 26, 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from the darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins an inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 4 and verse 6, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. He said, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. If we're going to be saved, you've got to have light. And you've got to have the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. You must be able to see and understand the gospel. Ephesians 5, 8, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. 1 Peter 2, 9, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness, into his marvelous light. Amen. What did Paul see? He saw a light from heaven. The night God saved me, a light was shined on me. I saw the light. Amen. To take it from an old uh, country song, I saw the light. Amen. Praise God. That night, the light shined on me. The light of the gospel, the light of my sins, uh, the light that I needed Jesus. Amen. It takes light to be saved. Then there was a voice. He heard a voice from heaven. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? As I said, I didn't hear a voice from heaven that night, but I heard the word of God. Amen? God spoke directly to Saul that day. But now God speaks to us through his written word. In John 5, 24, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. Amen. And shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Romans 10, 17, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. 1 Corinthians 13, 10, But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Amen. And so there was light, there was the voice, and then there was conviction. Verse number five, Jesus said, or Jesus said this, he said, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. The word the pricks means a goad, which was a sharp pointed stick that was used to prod and move oxen along. 
In Acts chapter 2, verse 37, the Bible said, And when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Conviction, amen. And conviction is the work of the Holy Spirit of God. When the light is shined on and the Word of God is given to you, the Holy Ghost brings conviction, amen. Oh, listen. Ephesians 6, 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, of the joints and marrows, the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Amen. I mean, praise God, the Holy Ghost brings conviction to that heart. Light brings, uh, the Word brings, and then the Spirit brings conviction. The Bible said in Acts chapter 7, verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. Stephen was given the gospel. Stephen was preaching Christ. And the Bible said when they heard it, they were cut to the heart. How did that happen? The Holy Ghost, the man, was pricking their hearts. And then it took faith. Look at verse 6. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go to the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Paul, or Saul, received Christ as his own Savior, believed him, trusted him as Lord. Amen. And uh, there may be a lot of different ideological things about Saul's conversion, but I believe he got saved there on the Damascus Road. His life changed that moment. Amen? Uh, and the fact is that God had already spoke to him. He saw something. I believe he saw something in Stephen's life. I believe there's where it all really began. When, they, when he watched them stone Stephen to death and Stephen prayed, God, lay not this sin to their charge, I believe they began to work in something in his heart. Amen? And, and think about it. Saul called Jesus Lord. Lord. The first time he said, Who art thou, Lord? But this time he said, Lord, what would thou have me to do? Amen. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3, Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus a curse, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. And so Paul himself declared that he was born again at the time he saw Christ. Notice what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 18. He said, and last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. Paul knew what happened to him on the Damascus Road. That was his conversion. And Paul freely admitted that he was a blasphemer before he was saved. 1 Timothy 1.13, he said, Who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. Amen. Oh, my. Isn't it amazing how God takes this man and as he's on his way with hatred in his heart, he's on his way to have people arrested that are saved and, and bring them back, have them jailed, have them beat, maybe even have them killed just like they did Stephen. But God changed him on the way. And then notice Saul, not only the persecutor, Saul, his conversion on the road to Damascus, but then Saul the Christian. Verse 6 tells us that Saul was frightened to the point of trembling. Amen. And in that astonishment, he cried out, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? I believe in that instant, Saul totally surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Not only was his trust uh, implicit, but he further submitted that, that same instant that he's Lord of his life. Amen. He wanted whatever the Lord will. He said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He totally submitted himself to Christ, trusted in him completely. Amen. Oh, isn't it amazing what God did in this man's life? 
Saul of Tarsus, has now met the Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus. His life now has been changed. As a matter of fact, after that experience, when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. He was blinded. And then, of course, God t told Ananias, he said, you need to go and you need to go to the house of, uh, that's on the street called Straight, and there you're going to inquire of one Saul of Tarsus. <laughs> and Ananias, I love Ananias. He said, Lord, I've heard about this man. Lord, is it really a good idea that I go down there? <laughs> Lord, do you know what he's done to them other people? Lord, I heard what happened to Stephen. Lord, he told Ananias, he said, he's a chosen vessel to me. Amen. And Ananias goes down there, walks in, and says, Brother Saul, hallelujah. And when he speaks to him, his eyes were open. And the Bible says as it had been scales that had uh, been uh, blocking his vision. It says that fell from his eyes as it had been scales and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Amen. I mean, it's amazing what God did with this one man. I, I'm not sure that at this particular moment that Saul really understood all that God would do with him. But God knew what he was going to do with him. Amen. And he knew that this man that had done all those wicked things would probably, uh, that he would give his whole heart into serving him. And of course, we know the story. He did give his whole heart in serving God. Beloved, tonight I'm thankful that God can save anybody. I know if God can save me, he, he wouldn't have no problem with many other people. God can save somebody like you. Amen. There are a lot of people that would just like you, just like me, that needs the Lord. You know what they can do? All they need to do is hear the gospel. All they need to do is, is hear about Jesus. Get them to the Lord. Amen. Let God deal with their heart and the Holy Spirit of God bring conviction in their life. There's no telling what God could do if they would just turn to Christ. This one man, we know what God did with him. He wrote most of the New Testament. God used him to write most of the, the New Testament. God used him in a great way. God used him to reach Gentiles. Thank God for that. Amen. God turned to the Gentiles. That's where you and I got in. I'm thankful for what God did in the life of Saul of Tarsus and changed his life completely. Amen. Father, I thank you tonight for the word of God. Thank you, Lord, as it, we read uh, the conversion of Saul, and how, God, you changed his life. Lord, I thank you, God, for the day that you changed my life. Thank you, Lord, for the day that the light shined in my life. The Spirit of God convicted me. I saw myself lost. And there was only one hope, and that was Jesus. God, I thank you for that day that you saved me. Thank you for changing my life, Lord. And I pray, oh God, that we could reach out to others that are lost and undone without God and his Son and share with them the gospel story that is able to save whosoever will. That will come. And Father, everything that's done will give you praise and glory. For we ask it in Jesus' name. While we stand tonight and our heads are bowed. I'm glad that God can save whosoever. God saved Saul. Tonight if you're saved, God saved you. And what a difference he made in your life. No telling what would have happened to Saul if he hadn't got saved on the road to man. No telling what would have happened to multitudes of other Christians because of him. But because of him, instead of people being hauled away and persecuted, they heard the gospel and were set free. May God help us tonight.
but just allow the Lord to use us. Have the same attitude that he had, Lord. What wilt thou have me to do? Father, thank you again for this day that you've given us. I thank you, Lord, for everyone that's been in the building here today. God, I do pray again for those who could not be here, those who are sick, asking you, God, to please touch them. God, make them whole. We know you can. We're asking, Father, God, that you'd raise them up. We pray for those in our families that are lost. Lord, those that have walked through the doors, those who've listened to the radio, those who've watched YouTube, those who've watched Facebook that are lost, we pray the Holy Ghost will bring conviction on their heart. Lord Jesus, please bless those tonight and help those that have grown cold and indifferent. Lord, they're walking a far distance away, and Lord, it shows in their life. Oh, God, help them tonight. Have your will, have your way. Send revival in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sure appreciate you being here tonight. I hope you have a, a great week this week. Pray one for another. Pray for all the ones who are sick, that they'll get well. Pray for our revival meeting coming up three weeks from tomorrow. Pray for the Easter Sunday service, that God will move in a great way. Try to invite your families, friends, co-workers, anybody you can to come be with us on Easter Sunday. Try to see the house of the Lord packed out as we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Amen. All right. Well, that's all.